The title of this message is Jesus, the Bread of Life. Jesus, the Bread of Life. He was born so that he could feed in the spirit a people. And this feeding would be a feeding that would lead to not natural life, but to spiritual life, eternal life. Um, Don't get me wrong. I mean, your spirit, whether you're saved or not, it's eternal. It will be eternal and will live forever. Um, We're speaking in spiritual terms here when we're talking about life and death. And life would be salvation Forgiveness, reconciliation with the Father, living in a, uh, a place called heaven. And it's not a geographical location so much as it is a being, a state of being. Whether we're in the spirit realm when we die or after he returns and recreates the new heaven and new earth. And we come and live here in our glorified bodies. Both are heaven. Because both are where the loving presence of God dwells. Now, God is everywhere. He's in hell as much as he's in heaven. It's just that he's not there in his love and his reconciliation in hell. He's there in his glory. He's there in his righteousness. And he may not be felt or seen, but his presence is there. Because his presence is everywhere. Amen? And so Jesus came, and he, he came, as I said before, this hopeless infant... And um, subjected himself in many ways to uh, a sinful mankind so that he could be the bread of life for each one of us. So I wanted to speak to you about the reason for this season, for Christmas. Jesus, the Messiah, our Christ, the anointed one. That's what Messiah and Christ both translate into. Messiah would be the Hebrew. Christ would be the Greek. Both of them mean anointed one. Now, any of us who have the presence of the Holy Spirit are anointed ones. Oh, I didn't silence my phone. Look at me. There we go. I forgot what I just said. All right, let's see my notes. Oh, anointed one. And so he arrives on earth on a mission. And the Bible tells us he, he arrived... In an um, emotional state of joy at being able to do this. First for the Father, and second for the ones the Father has called, drawn, and chosen. All right? If anyone wants to be a good investigator, you know, I was a private investigator for uh, many years before I moved upstate, and um, I had my own firm. Um, I did many crime scenes, I did many accident scenes, I did many fatalities, I did all of these things, and all of my investigations were based around determining who was at fault and exactly what happened. Because it it was all around lawsuits, people suing other people. I would be hired by the insurance companies, because they need to know if they're going to settle, or if they're going to make a payment, or how much they're going to offer based on the reality of what happened. And the same principle holds true in reporters. Uh, I don't know if it holds so true today. But the whole basis of reporting, of investigative journalism, is to ask several basic questions. In terms of Jesus Christ, why did he come? Where did he come from? Where did he arrive? Who sent him? Why did he send him? What did he come for? When did he come? And finally, how did he arrive? And I could extend that and say, how do we arrive into what he has come to give us? That's maybe the most important question. Because if you don't know how to be saved, you know, you might be doing yoga poses your whole life thinking that you're going to be in some sort of spiritual nirvana for eternity, only to find yourself under judgment. Very important question. How are we to be saved? So I'm going to speak to you uh, first this morning from the Gospel of Luke. 
in regards to some of these questions. And um, the bulk of my message, however, is going to be from John chapter 6. And it's going to speak to another question. Who was he? Who was this man? Who was this God that humbled himself in all of his divinity and royalty and power to accomplish a task on this earth that only he could accomplish? So for that, we're going to be in John chapter 6. In Luke's gospel, chapter 2, we read of the evening when Christ's arrival on the earth is... uh, heralded by an angel and then by the heavenly host. Just try to picture for a second, you outside on a, let's just say a cloudy night, right? And all of a sudden the clouds just break over to the very edges of what you can see on the horizons. Just a little frame of clouds. And the rest of it is filled with angels. How that would look to you. The enormity The magnificence and the glory of that kind of visitation. Shepherds were out in the field one evening guarding their sheep against wolves and other threats. When an angel of the Lord appeared to them. Now this angel, singular, was glorious. He was full of light. He was radiating brightly as he spoke the words to them. Which have been repeated every Christmas ever since. In a faithful church. From Luke chapter 2 verses 10 to 12. Fear not, the angel said to these shepherds. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And then this was immediately followed by the heavens ripping through the sky, tearing open the very atmosphere over them, and opening over the heads of these shepherds. Suddenly, with the brightness of many suns, the heavenly host appeared to these awestruck men. I mean, what emotion can you be feeling seeing something like this? A multitude of angels filling the night sky, now brighter than any cloudless noon sun. And together they shouted, proclaiming, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. I mean, I have to ask the question, even though I veer off a little bit. If that's what they said, peace among earth with whom he is pleased, it implies there is a people he is not pleased with. So it would behoove us to be a people pleasing to God, amen? And there's only one way to do that. We recognize Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Messiah, the Lord Christ, as Lord and Savior. So the shepherds, amazed, decided to go to the nearby town of Bethlehem to find this baby, this child. Matthew's gospel tells us of a star which appeared and literally led them to the place where Jesus was. And at the same time, the gospels tell us that way off in the distance were these magi. These were pagans. Who, were, who studied, they spent their life studying philosophies and religions. They knew the Hebrew scriptures. And they recognized that star. And when they saw that star, they set out on the journey also. But who was this child? And what would be the implications of his arrival? We flash forward now 31 years or so to find Jesus preaching to a multitude of people on a hillside. And there are reportedly 5,000 men there, along with women and children, bringing that number up to around 9,000, give or take. And Jesus wants to feed them, and there he performs one of his great miracles. He feeds everyone of the crowd with five loaves of bread and two fish. With baskets left over. And this crowd returns the next day seeking Jesus. 
And he informs them when they find him. Slide number three, please. Thank you. Six, uh, John 6, 26 to 27. Now they're there because he fed them food. All right. And he says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, you were seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Now, all of us have to work for food that perishes. We're talking about uh, temporal food, turkey, shrimp, ribs, beans, whatever it is. You need food to survive. So he's not telling you not to eat anymore. What he's telling you is that there's another food. A food that endures to eternal life. All the physical food you can eat, do, all that can do for you is give you another day. <laughs> give you the nutrients that your body needs to survive. Christ is not concerned about the food you need to survive. That's not why he came. He came because he wanted you to have a food that survives past your life into eternity. The food that never perishes. It endures. Jesus then tells them in verses 32 and 35. Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. And then in verse 35, Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. What? statements to make. We would do well to understand exactly what this living bread is and means for us. So the title of this is I am the bread of life, but I have five points here I'm going to go over with you today. The first one being the type and the fulfillment of that bread. Second one being the origin and sender of the living bread. Third point is the characteristics of living bread. Fourthly, the benefits of the living bread. And last but not least, the apprehension of the living bread. None of it makes any difference if the fifth point isn't there. It must be apprehended. And you can apprehend something and just stare at it and it'll do you absolutely no good. How do we actually apprehend the benefits of the living bread, Messiah? Point number one, the type and the fulfillment. In verse 32 and 33, Jesus says to them, well, just 32 for now, John 6, 32. Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven heaven. So in Exodus chapter 16, we have a wandering Israel. They've left Egypt. God has delivered them. And they are now wandering around the desert. They're wandering around Mount Sinai. And they're beginning to grumble. Because they have so little to eat in comparison to the, the rich delicacies they had as slaves in Egypt. Do you see the problem there? They're forgetting where God brought them from. And they're not walking in faith of where God is bringing them to, are they? And so God gives them manna in the wilderness. He, he ensures that they're going to survive. So they're eating manna. Manna on Monday, manna on Tuesday, manna on Wednesday. I take the manna. I have to get only what I need for the day. If you take more than what you need for the day, it's going to turn moldy. If you, and on Sunday or Saturday, you take twice the amount. Because uh, Friday, you take twice the amount because you're not supposed to work on the last day of the week. And so God supernaturally preserves that double portion from going bad. So you have fried manna on Monday. 
You have manna dumplings steamed on Tuesday with manna stuffing. You have uh, sautéed manna on Wednesday. And after a few, some time, they're like, we are getting pretty sick and tired of this manna, right? This manna was not the true manna, all right? Now, manna means simply uh, bread from heaven, all right? And it resembled little flakes. I mean, I can't really explain to you exactly what it looked like because I've never seen it rain manna. (laughs) But it had a taste like honey, we're told. All right. It was a food that they were to ingest every day that would give them life. It It would keep them alive. It would keep them nourished. And then on the Sabbath, they would eat the saved manna and it would do the same. But it was not the true manna. It was just a type. In other words, it was a representation of something greater. It was a partial revealing of something that would come later that would be much greater. And obviously I'm talking about Jesus. This manna um, was good for only one day. It perished. The food we buy to feed our stomachs every day also perishes doesn't it? So in many ways, this manna, although it rained down from heaven, it was provided from God, that manna in the desert was similar to the food that we would eat any given day in that both will perish. Man cannot provide the food which does not perish. Ever. Only God can provide that food. You know, when I was in my um, late teens to early 20s, I did yoga. And I had a guru. I was very into Eastern religions. And um, I did, I practiced yoga. They're called asanas, postures, every day for about two to three hours. Plus, I meditated. And um, this is a good illustration to you of of trying to, a, a man trying to do things that will earn him a higher spiritual state. And so, you know, we in the United States, you know, what I was doing is not the norm, obviously. What in the United States, most people, when you ask them about if they will go to heaven, they'll say, yes, I will attain that higher state. Well, why is that? Well, I'm a good person. They always refer back to what they have done overall. And they don't gauge themselves to God they gauge themselves to always people who are not as good as them so they can justify their own morality, all right? But we know as believers that there is nothing we can do on our own that will earn grace from God. The food of men give temporary physical sustenance only. Second point. The origin and sender of the living bread. And for this I have verses 32 to 33. Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God, this is the bread he gave us from heaven, is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And so this is a transition here from natural bread to spiritual bread, natural survival, natural life to eternal life to the world. And the statement does not say to you, therefore, all the world has this life. As we will see later, God has terms. Christianity is exclusive. There's a specific way to get there, which we will get into when we get to it. So God sent the manna of Exodus 16. In verses 32 and 33, God sent the true manna, the Christ. He who came specifically to renew spirits, regenerate spirits, and to um, gather in 
all those who not just during his physical lifetime, but from his physical lifetime all the way until he returns, all those whom God has called, drawn, called, and chosen. All those who will come to faith in Messiah. He is the true manna. And it was sent from heaven, just as God rained down flakes of nourishment from heaven in Exodus 16. So God rained down the eternal life from heaven in the Gospels. And the eternal origin of Christ, the eternal origin of the spiritual manna that gives eternal life is not just heaven, but it's also God, the Father. He is the originator. It wasn't Jesus' plan. It wasn't the Holy Spirit's plan. It was the person of the Father. It was his plan. Because man had broken covenant with God time and time again. God knew, and he always knew, that he would have to have a covenant that does not include mankind in it. As a uh, party of the covenant. He, in his eternal wisdom, made this covenant between him and Jesus. We are the fruits of the covenant. Son, you go down to earth. I have set apart a people, and I want you to bring them in. And the only way that's going to happen, my son, is by you living a sinless life and dying on a cross, uh, rising again and ascending. And now, obviously, I'm paraphrasing here because there is no scripture on the discussion between the father and the son. But I could see the, the son saying back to the father under the new covenant, I will do this. Under, I will do this joyfully, Lord. I want to bring you glory under the, the, the guarantee that all those who cry out to me, I will bring to you. And the Father says, done. And because of that, we have the scriptures that tell us that no one will pluck them out of my hand. It's the doctrine of eternal security. It's the doctrine of once saved, always saved, which I'm not going to get into today. But the truth of the matter is, brother and sister, if you are saved, you are saved. God will not renege. And in short, somebody who died, who's, who professed Christ and dies and goes to hell, were never truly saved. They didn't persevere. We shall persevere. I trust each one of you here today who know the Lord Jesus Christ, I will see you in eternity. Amen. Third characteristic, the characteristics of living bread. All right, I'm going to need you to look at your Bibles here. Let me just get to my uh, spot here. Verse 27 Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, God the Father has set his seal. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. This bread does not perish This bread endures to eternal life. Obviously, he's not talking about the manna in Exodus 16. He's talking about what he can provide for you and for me. For anyone who would repent and believe. And repentance and belief are the very foundation stones of God's saving grace. You have to turn from your sins, from your sinful lifestyle. You must turn your back on them, forsaking them and walk towards the cross, the Son, the Father. 
A person who can't do that, it doesn't matter how much they profess Jesus as Lord and Savior. They haven't apprehended the foundations of our salvation, the foundations of our faith in repentance and belief. And as I said before, that salvation that you receive endures to eternal life. Now, your level of faith does not endure to eternal life. All right? We have, this is our faith. (laughs) Have it one day, don't have it. You know, and as we mature in the Lord, may those peaks and valleys close in on each other so that you become more stable in faith on the storms of life, right? Right? But all throughout this process of sanctification, of being made holy, God is your righteousness, Jesus. It is his perfection that we are clothed with, imputed on us. That's what that means. It's put onto us. And you can't pierce that clothing with your own faults to remove you from his loving embrace and salvation, if you are truly his. He is the true bread, not the false bread. He is the living bread. Being the true bread means that he delivers a nourishment and a life that endures past your death here on earth. And there are many different breads that claim to do that, to be able to do that. But you have to understand, he is the Messiah, singular. There's only one bread that delivers to eternal life. And that is the bread the Father sent. And that is Jesus. The living bread, then, Jesus, accomplishes the will of the sender, the Father. You see, so there's no need for other breads. If Jesus is, let's use a Jewish bread, rye, there's no need for wheat. There's no need for whole fla- uh, white flour. There's no need for barley flour bread. There's no need for dinner rolls. There's no need for croissant God sent his way, and his way won't fail because he is sovereign over all his creation. So there's no need. Well, you know, we have Indians in India, and we have Chinese people in China. Don't they need their own way? No. You see, this is why Jesus was born where he was born. Do you know that the Middle East is called the cradle of the world? Because every nationality, every race that we have has, was exported from the Middle East. So the Savior who came is the Savior of the world. So Jesus accomplishes the will of the Father who is the sender. Verse 39 The Father's will is to lose nothing of all the Father has given him. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing. I should lose how? Wait a minute, I know about 60 Christians who aren't walking with the Lord anymore. I mean, you know, they chose him. They chose to follow him, and then they chose not to follow him. So how can he make that statement? That's that's false. Your Bible's false. No. I should lose nothing of all he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. That tells me that somebody who, who chose Christ and then chose to leave Christ were not given to Jesus by the Father. Because he will lose none of whom the Father has given him. Not only that, he will raise him up. He will raise us up on the last day. Hallelujah. Because if he couldn't raise us up on the last day, as the Apostle Paul tells us for the second time today, your faith is a waste of time. Go party. Eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. 
But we believe more than that, don't we? In verse 40, that eternal life would be given to all who would, A, look on the Son, and B, believe in the Son. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks in the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will, will raise him up, her up, on the last day. So you're called to do two things. You have to look on the Son. Praise God. I looked on the Son. I'm saved. I've studied about him. I've gone to church. I've shouted hallelujah. And I've looked on the Son. Well, yeah, I still party. I mean, you know, and, and, and I still have my girlfriend. We're not going to get married. Who needs marriage, right? We just live together and have sex all the time. And, and, but I believe in this Jesus. I lived that kind of life for many years, folks. The world loves nothing more than to blend with your faith. It'll tell you, hey, man, you could praise the Lord, worship Jesus, man. It's all good. You got grace. But see, that's not what he says in this verse. You have to believe in him. And believing in Jesus connotates a trust in him. Well, I trust in Jesus. Do you? Are you living according to his word? No, I just trust in this Jesus who saves me. I want to be able to do all these different things. I just, as long as I remain ignorant and I, can, I, don't, have, I don't read any of this, I will not see what he has called me to. I won't see his commandments. You see, Christianity has commandments. Our Lord commands us to do things. And so we learn, once we get serious about studying God's word, we learn that he will not compromise with the world. That he firmly has set himself up as the enemy of the world and its ways. So much so that he tells you, listen, if you're going to follow me, understand this. The world hated me. The world is going to hate you. But you must look on him and you must believe in him. So belief has more than just making a blanket statement, I believe in Jesus. Belief means discipleship. It means I, I believe in him to the extent that I'm learning about him. I'm incorporating his word into my life and I am pursuing a closer walk with him on a day-to-day -day basis. Using the word as my true north so to speak, on a compass. Verse 48, slide number 10. Uh, I am. These are the seven I am's of Jesus. Now, in the book of Exodus, Moses, they arrive at Mount Sinai, and Moses um, goes up this mountain. Actually, no, this is before he brings them out. He goes up to the mountain. He's shepherding for Jethro, and... Um, He's in exile from Egypt, and he sees the mountain storming in a supernatural way, so much so that he decides to go check it out. It's not just a thunderstorm. And he goes up, and he meets God. The Father comes to him in a bush. And so he, 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 uh, he ordains Moses, and he commissions Moses to a task, I can relate to this, that he knows he can't accomplish on his own. God rebukes him. <laughs> and then Moses says, who, who shall I say you are? And you know what God answers? I am who I am. And so in the gospel of John, throughout the chapters, we see J Jesus make the same statement seven times relating to seven different facets of who he is as God. And here we are in verse 48, which is in our chapter we're looking at today. I am the bread of life. Meaning, I am he who when you feed off of me, I imbue in you the power of eternal life contrasted against eternal condemnation. 
eternal damnation. I am the bread of life. The second one, John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. I am. Now, I want you to see in 48 and 12, uh, 648 and 812, I am the. Actually, I can go right down the, the row. I am the. The means what? Singularity. Exclusivity. I am the light of the world. So let's make this real. Buddha is not the light of the world. Your guru is not the light of the world. Scientology is not the light of the world. Hinduism is not the light of the world. Uh, Baha'ism is not the light of the world. Wicca is not the light of the world. And I can go on and on and on. At least in Hinduism, they're honest. They have a million gods. A god for everything. John 10, 7, and 9. I am the door of the sheep. There are no other doors for the sheep to go in and out. When they go in, they're in the flock of the Father, under the care of the Father. When they go out, when do, sh when do sheep go out? Who accompanies the sheep whenever they go out? The shepherd. John 10, 11, and 14. I am the good shepherd. What's the implication there? All the other shepherds aren't good. They may seem like they're good. They may try to convince you they're good. They may give you permission or bless you to do things that you think are good. They'll give you all of those things minus Jesus. And that makes them bereft of any saving power. Next slide, please. Number five. I am the resurrection and the life. Again, singular. There's only one way to be resurrected and to live into life. And again, spiritual term, uh, spiritual life as opposed to spiritual condemnation, eternal condemnation in hell. John 14, 6, I am the way. He, here he just lays it out. I mean, you can't argue as a person of another faith against this. I am the way and the truth and the life. And here's, the, and, and I'll double down. No one comes to the Father except through me. Which is bad news if, you know, it's one thing to say in our Judeo-Christian faith that the Buddhist and the Hindu, you know, it's clear. But try saying that to a religious, unsaved Jewish person who is a worshiper of the Father. Now it's a little more difficult and, and, I, and that's a task, being messianic, to have that as your focus group that you're targeting. Because that, you'll get the most blowback there. Or you'll get salvations, won't you? Right? And then finally, John 15, verses 1 and 5. I am the true vine. But what does that speak of? That speaks of a source of life. The branches are attached to the vine. The branches cannot live unless the vine feeds them. Now, in addition to this, I'm going to add another one. It's not um, strictly one of the I am's, but it speaks of his power. And that's in John 18, verse 6, where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and the Roman troops, 500, uh, not Roman, uh, uh, Jewish troops come to arrest Jesus. And they said, who, where, who is this Jesus of Nazareth? Where is he? And he answers, I am. And they drew back and fell to the ground. You want to get slain in the spirit? There you go. It's, only, it's the only time you see this. You see it twice. You see it here. And you see it when uh, John goes in the book of Revelation. He's brought to heaven and the angel comes to speak to him and he falls on the ground. And the angel goes, no, 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 no. Don't do that. 
Get up. I'm a man just like you. And in your Bible, it'll say, when Jesus said to him, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. They do that for literary understanding, for a flow. But that's not what it says. It says, I am in the Greek. He's just coming out and saying, I am, the, I am God. And the power of those words, it could have done a lot more, believe me, made them all fall to the ground. And then we have a statement of who Jesus is not. John 17, 16. I am not of the world. So I can, I can now tie these verses together and go, well, if he is the good shepherd and he is the door and he is the vine and all these others are not, we can say that they therefore are of the world. The world is full of human beings who ever since, the, uh, ever since Christ came have been trying to, to bypass him. Because the thing Christ wants, it's a little thing. It's all of you. He doesn't want 20% obedience to him. He doesn't want 30% of your heart. He wants all of you. And that's why he says, unless you pick up your cross death instrument, unless you pick up your death instrument and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. You cannot. Impossible. So on this walk of faith as believers in Christ, understand if you have not given him all of your life yet, if you have been yet to surrender all of your sins, all of your uh, ungodly passions and desires and lusts, that's where you're headed. And if you can't do that, what does Jesus say? Count the cost. Your walk with Christ will cost you everything about you and in you that is not of God. Are you willing to pay that price? I met the Lord. He saved me. I count it all as waste, as dung, as garbage compared to knowing the Lord my God. Now, I'm not saying I'm perfect and I'm not saying I don't sin. I'm just saying that that, I am set on that. I am his. I have given my life half-heartedly to God in my past. I know what that's like. I thought I was saved until he saved me. Then I was like, ooh, I wasn't even saved. I was a compromised person. I was a professor of Christ. I wasn't a believer. May we all believe, put our trust in him. Next category, the benefits of the living bread. In verse 33. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The living bread gives life. Not just temporal, physical life, but spiritual, eternal life. The bread of God is he, singular, not they. He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. It is Jesus. He is Jesus. Verse 35, he satisfies hunger and thirst. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Praise God. Now, don't get this confused with whoever comes to me shall never feel um, cold in their faith. Whoever comes to me shall never feel suffering. Whoever comes to me shall never feel, never feel pain. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that despite all of the trials you will encounter in your life, you will know who your deliverer is. You will know who came and died for you, that you can have eternal life. You will know that regardless of what life throws at me here in the temporal world, I have assurance for 10,000 years. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. And that's just a drop in the bucket. 
that never has a bottom. We are eternal beings in Christ Jesus. Alive. And that is the life. So he satisfies the hunger and thirst. In the midst of my trials, I don't cry out. I don't go, you know what? I'm going to try Buddha because Jesus, this ain't cutting it. I need a God that's going to take away all my struggles. I don't want to suffer, so I'm going to start doing yoga. I don't want to have pain, so I'm going to hang out at the bar and use alcohol. I don't want, you know what I mean? You, uh, uh, the true child of God says, I will get through this for you. are my forward guard and my rear guard. You are walking hand in hand. You know what? You aren't even walking hand in hand. You are carrying me through this. You know what, Lord? You're not, you're not carrying me. You're not walking me hand in hand. You will drag me through this. Verse 37, two, two points. All that the Father gives me will come to me. End of story. All, God will not fail in his salvation of any soul. All, every single person God has named as his, Jesus came to redeem. And they all will be redeemed. Jesus will not have to report back to the Father, you know, Lord, I know, I know, you know, I rescued all these people, but this group here, they, they decided not to. So I had to let them go. I don't know what, you know. Is that the God you want to worship? <sighs> And then the second part, whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. I will never cast out. You know what that speaks of? Your ongoing imperfection in Christ. He never will look at you and go, you know what? I've had it with you. Go. He never will. So when you see those who leave and you see those who forsake and you see those, you know, these are people who all were members of the church or, you know, professing Christians and you see they've left whatever faith it was they had, you realize they never really had it because he's got the power to give it. He's got the power to sustain it. He's got the power to bring you to its end, which is deliverance, delivery in the face of the father in his presence and you have life and he looks at you and he goes my child verse 39 I should lose nothing of all that he has given me but raise it up on the last day my friend my brother my sister he will raise us up on the he will get us to the end your role persevere Keep seeking his face. Stay in the battle. Verse 40. Everyone who looks on the son and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Fifth point. The apprehension of the living bread. As I said, this is important because the the first four describe Jesus all about him. It's his complete biography. Verse 5 is how you apprehend that, what he has to give. Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So that means there are people the Father will not draw. And there are people he will. So now, go down to verse 49, and we're going to read from there to 58. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. 
Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father... So whoever feeds on me, he will also, also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like the bread the fathers ate and died. That's in reference to the manna. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. So verses 49 and 50. The living bread, Jesus, gives life beyond the mere physical. He provides eternal spiritual life. Verse 51. The bread that he will give for the life of the world is his flesh. Not so you could eat his hand like a cannibal. But offered as a spiritual sacrifice. The Passover lamb of God. Verses 53 to 55. This bread must be consumed if it would provide life, eternal life. It must be ingested. It has to be placed in your mouth. It has to be chewed, and it has to be swallowed in whole. You can't just nibble at it. You can't hold it before you and go, oh, man, this bread is sweet. It won't give you life if you do that. You can't go, "Mm, it tastes good. I'll eat it later. There's a lot of people you know who are professing believers that do just these things. You have to go, this this will give me eternal life. I want it all. I give you all because you gave me all on the cross. That is what it means to eat his flesh and drink his blood. I say it almost every week when we do communion. He feeds us. He sustains us. He gives us our daily bread through his word, through his words to us and comfort to us in prayer, to our, in our song to him. That's eating his flesh. Drinking his blood continually every day going to him like we did at the beginning of service today and saying, Lord, I need forgiveness. I thought some really bad things this week. I I didn't even do them, Lord, but I'm still thinking them, Lord, please. The blood covers the sins, doesn't it? The blood cleanses from sin, doesn't it? Verse 56, consuming the flesh and the blood equates to an abiding in him. Give us this day our daily bread. I don't just do it on Sunday. I don't just do it on Wednesday. I don't just do it on Tuesday. Every day I start my day praying to God, reading his word, and then setting out on whatever business I have. And I pray you do too. It's defined, this abiding, as even as abiding in him as he in them. And he in them. The Bible says that, um, that he and the Father will come and sup with us. In other words, he'll come and have dinner with us. It's in, the, in Eastern cultures, I mean, it's like one of the most welcoming you know, loving things that you can do for a guest is you come is is a meal. You break bread together, right? As an Italian, I, I really relate to that. Verse 58, this bread is not like the bread their fathers ate, manna in the wilderness, and they still died. They ate the manna literally, flakes that came from heaven. They died spiritually, minus having a faith, an Abrahamic faith, in a coming Messiah, a coming Redeemer. Christ is no longer here. So you can't eat his body and drink his blood. That's a dilemma. Ever since he died, that that became a dilemma. So, again, the imaginations of men. Somebody decided, well, you know what we'll do? 
We'll say a prayer, and we'll hold up the bread and the wine, and, and we'll do it. Hey, here's what we'll do. We'll do it three times. And every time we do it, I want you. You got the bells? Ring the bells. So you hold it up, and they go, bring, bring, bring. And at that moment, Jesus Christ, by command of the priest, descends from heaven onto the altar of sacrifice and once again dies for you every week in the Roman Catholic Church. Now look, you know, they'll, they have many reasons why this is okay, and I'm not here to dispute that. All I'm saying is, in my book, it's blasphemy. He does not come anywhere at my command. I mean, what, what kind of hubris does it take to even suggest I can command God? So we don't believe in this. Christ, the bread of life, is not like the manna. It's not like the bread on the altar in that church. It's in drinking the juice and eating the matzah, we are doing two things. The first one is we're memorializing, we're remembering Christ's atoning sacrifice. Do this in memory of me. Second thing we're doing is we're making the symbolic statement every week that we eat his word that we internalize as part of our being Christ and the Bible. I have a personality that's flawed, but I have vowed it is to be conformed 100% to this word. I will do the best that I can, and I know I can't do it. I am trusting God by his spirit to do the work. I'm doing my part in, in reading it and incorporating it as best as I can. And when I fail, I go before the throne of grace and the high priest in heaven, Jesus Christ, testifies before the Father in the presence of Satan himself. He is ours, Lord. Amen. Yes, Lord. God. That we are redeemed and atoned for by his death and are born again in the spirit of his Holy Spirit by Christ's life-giving power. So in conclusion, the bread of life gives the needed nourishment that is unto spiritual life. Christ's words are pointing towards the new covenant of grace. The manna was sent daily. He came and died for sins one time. But we eat daily of his daily bread. Right? Every day I partake of the bread. The manna was rained down from heaven. Christ was sent from heaven. The manna was sent by the Father. Jesus was sent by the Father. It was gathered daily in Exodus 16. Give us this day our daily bread. On that glorious night in the field, the shepherds saw the heavens opened up to the earth. And one glorious day, around 33 years later, the apostles and all who were with them watched as Jesus ascended to heaven. And two angels appeared as they, they were like, and they're like, men of Galilee. This is the last slide. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. How do you know Christ is returning? He, we will see him returning. It won't be on CNN that Jesus returned in China. It won't be on MSNBC that he appeared in Alabama. The whole world will witness his coming. I don't know how that's possible. But I don't need to know how that's possible. All I need to know is that's how I'll know. It'll be a magnificent sign. Truly, Jesus Christ was, is, and always will be the Son of God, the Savior, and the Lord. 
And truly, his gospel is good news. It is the best news ever given to the one who is called, chosen, and drawn. To he or she who would cry out to him, Lord, save me, a sinner. I am not worthy of your grace, and yet I ask for it. I am unable to be justified, but I ask you to justify me. Christ is the living bread, and he is our daily bread. Will we live by faith to faith daily in obedience to Christ and his word? Will we turn from our sinful lifestyle of of not looking at God, not acknowledging him, not living for him, not learning about him, and start that walk towards him? And it's a purifying walk. You, you're, you're making distance between your past sins, who you are in the flesh, and incorporating the mind of Christ into who you are. Will we be depending on Christ every day to be our sight, our hearing, our mind, our mouths, our hands, and our feet in what we would think, say, and do? Will you trust in him today by repenting and believing? Crying out to the bread of life for life eternal. He died for your sins. We all were born under the death sentence of hell. But if you repent and believe today, he can rescue. He can rescue you from that fate. When we die, we'll see how real it really is. And how unimportant the things of this world really were. I beg of you, get down on your knees if you do not know him. Maybe today after church, tonight, and just say, Lord, if you are real and you are the Savior, I confess I need you. Please save me. In the name of Jesus, amen? Amen. Father God, I thank you for this word. I thank you for your... um, your heart. I thank you for your desire to send your son. Lord, only you could accomplish this wonderful thing. And we are grateful, Lord. We love you, Lord. Thank you for being the bread of life to me and to all who would know you. Lord, I eat wholeheartedly all that you have to feed me. 